Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be reviewing and paging through Call of Cthulhu Does Love Forgive from Chaosium Inc. Will keepers and players alike love these two one-to-one -one Call of Cthulhu adventures or should someone at Chaosium be seeking forgiveness for hoisting a couple of less than stellar adventures on the public? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I am going to be reviewing Call of Cthulhu Does Love Forgive in just a moment. But before I dive in, I do want to take a moment to uh, thank everybody once again for all your kind thoughts and prayers regarding my recent triple bypass surgery. It's been almost a month since the surgery and so far the doctors are telling me that i am way ahead of the curve as far as uh, what usually happens after a triple bypass so big thumbs up and thank you all for the kind thoughts and prayers that you have sent my way all right so today i am going to be reviewing and paging through call of cthulhu who does love forgive from chaosium inc it's written by lynn hardy Eris Kaminska and Anna Marie Mazur with artwork provided by Marcin Lesniak. This 64 page soft cover carries an MSRP of $12.99. You can grab the PDF over at Drive Through RPG for $5.99. Do want to remind you that the gaming gang is an affiliate of the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to go visit, say, Drive Through RPG, please stop by the gaminggang.com first, click on one of our banner ads, and if you happen to make a purchase, I get a little portion of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do help keep the gaming gang around. All right, let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got Call of Cthulhu Does Love Forgive? All right, so let's take a look at the back here. But before I jump in, I do want to mention that the fine folks over at Chaosium Inc. were kind enough to send me this review copy, but neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share my thoughts about this book with you. These days, it is very important for you to know that. All right, so these are two one-to-one -one scenarios for Call of Cthulhu, which in essence, means one player and one keeper. I'm not going to read everything on the back here, but first off, we've got Love You to Death, Chicago, February 15th, 1929. It's a cold winter's day when the investigator's good friend, Hattie May, appears in their office at the detective agency. Her beloved pet dog, Highball, is scheduled to be destroyed later today, and she needs the investigator's help getting him back from the Chicago Police Department. It doesn't sound like too difficult a task, does it? Then we have Mask of Desire, New York, September 1932. The investigator, together with their two close friends, Anna Conrad and Lucas Reston, has been invited to a party at wealthy and notorious socialite Madame de Tisson's swanky apartment on the Upper West Side. Anna is somewhat distracted by her audition tomorrow for a famous jazz orchestra. What is the link between the audition and a mysterious parcel that arrives the next day? And why do so many people seem to be interested in the contents of that parcel? All right, let's jump on in here. So I should mention, normally, I try to stay as spoiler-free in these reviews as I possibly can. Today, not so much, because for me to critique these two adventures, I do have to go into a bit more detail about what's going on in each of these than I normally would. So if you are a player 
and you're hoping that your keeper is going to run either one or both of these scenarios, I would definitely recommend tuning on out and checking out any one of the over 1,000 videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. All right, so hopefully it's just keepers, potential buyers, and myself. So we're going to jump on in here. And first we'll get an introduction. It talks a little bit about setting up these two adventures. And these adventures could be relatively difficult to run because at the heart, no pun intended, of both of these adventures is a possible love interest. And that can be rather difficult to actually pull off in a role-playing game. In fact, for both these adventures, I think it'd be very difficult, and I am going to get into more detail about that in just a few moments. But talking about how you can go about making these love stories, talking about how even though these are essentially one-to-one -one adventures that the player characters do have a support network that they can turn to, that there are other NPCs that are available to the players to, uh, to help them out. So first off, we've got Love You to Death, which be, being somebody who grew up in Chicago, born and raised, spent about 30 years living in the city of Chicago, I was pretty excited to see this adventure because the way it's presented is that it kind of ties into the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. In fact, the adventure takes place the following day. And essentially what's going on here is the player character is a private investigator and they happen to be an orphan. And they had two very close friends who were both girls in the orphanage that they grew up in. And one of them, Hattie Mae, uh, has actually stayed very close to the investigator, to the private eye. In fact, it's very possible that the private eye actually is secretly in love with Hattie Mae, who is married. Well, she is married up to the day before this adventure kicks off. So what happens is that Hattie Mae has a dog, Highball, and Hattie Mae had a husband who was involved with uh, Deanna Banyan's gang, who, of course, were the targets of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So her husband has been killed. So she comes to the private investigator's office, the agency that they work at, uh, just frazzled because not only has her husband been murdered, uh, Highball has been taken in by the police and is scheduled to be put down uh, because the dog has attacked uh, some police officers. Because the dog was there at the massacre and saw these men dressed as police officers gun down the dog's master. So the dog thinks that all police officers are bad is essentially what's going on. So the player character is tasked with trying to get the dog back. And what happens is they have a, a good friend on the inside with the Chicago Police Department. So it's actually relatively easy for them to have the dog released. But in the meantime, Hattie disappears. Because, remember, I had mentioned there were two girls that were very close to the private investigator as an orphan, and one of them actually uh, has been in love with that character for years. And what they've done is they've been able to learn a spell that will allow them to switch places with Hattie Mae. And they plan on, of course, murdering Hattie while she's in the other body. Following so far? <laughs> so the player character has to track down Hattie with the help of Highball 
and put a stop to this identity switch effectively uh, before it's too late. And uh, strangely enough, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways for a highball to get killed in this. And I'm not real big on, on little kids and animals dying, especially in games. Yeah, you can sometimes kind of, you know, dangle that out there. Uh, there's a lot of ways that the player character just doesn't figure out what's going on in this adventure as well. Personally, I think this is a pretty weak adventure. I didn't really care for it for a variety of different reasons. One is that when you're rolling up the character, you have to make the character as an orphan and they've got these two friends and you're kind of, kind of pigeonholing the character into what needs to be present for this adventure as opposed to allowing the player character to kind of create their own player, player character however they would like. Uh, something else is that uh, it's tied into the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but it's not. I mean, there's really nothing going on in this adventure that reflects that. Also, there's uh, some addresses that are thrown out there, some Chicago addresses that that don't really jive. Uh, and, of course, somebody who, who has never lived in Chicago or isn't very familiar with Chicago would notice these things. But I did. So it's, it's kind of funny because it's mentioned that uh, the whole setting of Chicago and the day after the St. Valentine's Day massacre is, is really baked into this. It's not. So didn't, didn't think much of this adventure at all. Then we've got Mask of Desire, which on, on the whole, I think it's a better adventure, but I think it's got even more problems than the first adventure. And essentially what's going on here is we have the player character, has two roommates, Anna Conrad, who is an aspiring singer, and Lucas Reston, who is the uh, son of a wealthy family, and he's trying to be Anna's agent, and he's, he's really trying to be her, her muse and, and really drive her career. And those are actually the player characters, two roommates, which... Think about this. So Anna is supposed to be a very beautiful young woman. Lucas is like in his 20s. The player character is probably in their 20s. Two men and a woman living together in the same apartment was pretty radical in the 70s for Three's Company. 1932, that is a real head scratcher. I am not sure who came up with that idea that it's just not something that you would see. And I know this, these are, you know, these are adventures. This is all fiction. It's not historically like seeped in actual history and that's fine, but point that out. Uh, I don't have any issue with, you know, there being a little disclaimer saying, Hey, you know, we're playing around with history a little bit. We're just tossing this in here. But it's presented as if, you know, that would be just the norm. And that is certainly not the case. So essentially what's going on here is Anna has terrible stage fright, but she's wonderfully talented, but she has crippling stage fright. And Lucas is secretly in love with Anna. And Anna has found herself in the position of having an audition for a famous jazz singer who is going on an international tour, or I should say jazz band, jazz orchestra. And uh, it could be her big break. But the night before, they've also been invited to this party at this uh, notorious uh, debutante's apartment. Uh, she's showing off her art collection and a big part of the Art collection is a series of various different masks. So a lot of this stuff is pretty interesting, and I like how it kind of ties together. But the wheels fall off of this relatively quickly. So 
essentially what happens is that this uh, this debutante has a mask that will basically provide your heart's desire. It's the mask of desire. It is a Japanese mask, although the players probably originally will think it's Chinese. And whoever wears it, it will alter them. And this starts to fall, the, the wheels start to fall off this because a lot of different things could possibly happen. And it's sort of like we get, as far as the options go, sort of like we get everything plus the kitchen sink tossed in. Well, what if Anna wears the mask? What if Lucas wears the mask? What if the player character puts on the mask? What if nobody takes puts the mask on? Plus, there is a Japanese agent who is trying to get their hands on this mask by any means necessary. So that's another element that's been tossed into this as well because uh, the debutante is making a deal with Lucas to give them the mask and Lucas needs to decide, does he want to wear the mask so he can possibly become the man that Anna would fall in love with? Or does he have Anna put on the mask? That way she can get over her crippling stage fright for this audition. There's a, uh, a professor uh, that knows more about the mask and who can decipher some, some uh, Chinese writing in the box for the package that's delivered to the player character and the other NPC's apartment because the debutante has sent that mask along to Lucas. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on in this. And this, this adventure just doesn't seem to wrap up. It's, it's got way too many plot threads floating out there. There are way too many options about what could happen. Okay. If, if so-and-so wears the mask and this happens, then this could happen. And it's, it's just, too scattered, in my opinion, as far as the adventure. I, I do like the core idea behind the adventure, but then once again, your player character, when you're rolling the character up, has to fall into these certain categories. And of course, they got to be the roommates and they have to have these two roommates that they're, they're fond of. Plus, there's a possibility that the player character could be in love with Anna and there's just way too much going on. Another aspect of both of these adventures is that they kind of share the same underlying theme. And the same underlying theme isn't necessarily love. The underlying theme is becoming somebody that you aren't. So in our first adventure, we have the one woman who's trying to switch places with the friend of the player character or possible love interest of the player character. And then in the second adventure, we have the mask, which will allow the person who wears the mask to achieve their heart's desire. But of course, at a cost, they will eventually go mad. So of course, nothing, nothing in Call of Cthulhu comes without a price. So we get the author biographies. Of course, we had the, the, handouts we've got extra character sheet as well and then we get some ads and that is does love forgive for call of cthulhu from chaosium inc let me swing on over to the cam uh, other camera and i will provide my final thoughts and a review score <sighs> gotta say i was disappointed with these two adventures as i as i mentioned I think the, the biggest problem that I have with the adventures is that there's a, well, there's a few, but both of them share the same problems. And, and that is that you're supposed to be creating these relationships with these NPCs that are supposed to be very important to the player character. Yet the reality is none whatsoever. There's, there's no, no emotional payoff. And one of the things I, I talk about when I'm 
when I talk about Call of Cthulhu and some of the famous adventures and campaigns that have arrived over the decades, like Mastiff Nair Lothotep, there is a character who draws the players into the adventure that if you do not introduce this character in earlier adventures and establish a relationship, when something terrible happens to that character, which is really supposed to spur on the players, it's kind of like, eh, it's just another NPC. But it shouldn't play out like that. And and to really get the bang for the buck out of these adventures, you really should have established some sort of, of relationship long before. But once again, these adventures are just designed really for a single session and for one keeper and one player. So I think the emotional attachment, I think, is is very difficult. The concept of love at the gaming table can be very odd for a lot of people. So I think that is kind of a problem as well. So I think that is an issue. And once again, both of these adventures kind of revolve around the same thing. Somebody trying to be someone they're not. And, you know, like I said, the the first adventure is kind of bland. And the second adventure just is all over the place with the the multitude of options of what what can be going on in the adventure, as well as it just kind of dangles there without a really good oomph kind of conclusion to the adventure. All in all, on a scale of 1 to 10, I only give Call of Cthulhu does love forgive a 6 out of 10. They're not horrible adventures. There is good stuff in there that you could salvage out and maybe use as like kind of like B adventures during a campaign. Things that are going on in the background or something just uh, just when you're running a campaign, something that's just going to kind of change the, uh, the palette, like a palette cleanser during the adventures. So I'm not going to say it's terrible, but I got to be honest, I was kind of shocked because vast majority of times I love everything that comes out from Chaosium for Call of Cthulhu just don't think that much of does love forgive. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like the video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review. It'll also let you know when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs right here on YouTube. As I not only bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news, but also first looks at tabletop games as well. And of course, once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. And until I see you next, here's hoping you enjoy some great gaming with your gang. Oh, you're still here. Well, while you're kicking it, how about subscribing to the Gaming Gang channel or seeing the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch or finding out what YouTube recommends you check out here at my channel. And of course, don't forget, get your geek on at thegaminggang.com.